Amen, amen. Thank you, praise team, for that. <laughs> hey, do you notice they painted my pulpit? The paint is still wet. I need to remember <laughs> to stop touching that pulpit. This is so you can see the words uh, underneath me right now. Uh, Ed, I, I want to thank you again for sharing, and I uh, made the mistake of glancing at your uh, comments right before coming up here. here. Let's do this, church. Can we do this? Because you're not here in person to, to, to give Ed uh, a, a hug or to, uh, to, to share with, with joy. Can we do this? Uh, can, can you uh, take some time this week and write a note of encouragement? Uh, whatever you would have said to Ed, whatever you would have said to, to Joy, how about, you, how about you write that down and you stick that in the mail uh, to them? You don't know what their address is. I don't know what it is either. Uh, maybe mail it to the church. You mail it to the church, put their name on it, and I'll make sure uh, that they get that. But let's just flood them uh, with, uh, with encouragement. Um, okay, if you have been sitting, stand up, stretch, get ready to hear God's word. If you're uh, standing, sit down, find a Bible. We're in Acts chapter 12. Uh, just three housekeeping items before we get to the sermon. Number one, we have really enjoyed doing the sermon Q&A and roundtable, and that will continue, uh, but not this Sunday. I want to give our volunteers a break, let them go home uh, early this uh, Memorial Day uh, weekend, so look forward to that coming uh, back next uh, Sunday. Number two, uh, for the month of May, if you're just joining us, our church is memorizing some or all of Psalm 91, and it's not too late for you to join us. If you have, uh, if you're only two verses in, keep going, man, keep going. It has been such an encouragement. Uh, I know for my family, and just hiding God's word uh, in our heart, uh, you can sign up. You can find that, uh, uh, the, the link for that on our website. Let us know that we're doing that together. Uh, that was number two. And then number three, uh, lots of questions about when are we going to open? When are we going to open? When are we going to open? First, I'm going to tell you we never closed. <laughs> Cornerstone has never closed. Um, we're going to do it as quickly as we can. We're going to do it as safely as we can. We're going to do it as legally uh, as, uh, as we can. Uh, no one is more anxious to see us back uh, in person uh, than myself. Uh, very happy to see that Governor Wolf uh, is moving Chester County from red shelter in place to yellow. A little bit uh, more freedom. I know it's a lot uh, to keep track of. I live just 13 minutes away from the church. I drive through three different states to get to uh, Cornerstone. Uh, Delaware churches are uh, worshiping this, uh, this morning. Maryland churches are able to worship this morning. We have a different situation in Chester County, and uh, we will be obeying the civil uh, uh, authorities, uh, but eager, uh, eager to figure this out. We're working hard behind the scenes to put some plans uh, in place. So you can be praying. Pray for the leadership of the church. Pray for your elders. Pray for myself. Um, we'll get through this. Okay, uh, on to the sermon. Acts chapter 12, we're in verses 20 to 25, a shorter passage this morning. Uh, so we're in the midst of a sermon series uh, out of the book of Acts. We're looking at the early church, uh, God's mission, God's power, God's people in particular, paying attention to those three themes as we study the book of Acts together. And uh, this morning, uh, Peter, freshly released from prison. Uh, Luke, the author of Acts, is going to continue uh, the story with Herod. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to turn it over to Tom McCauley, who's going to read our uh, passage. And uh, Tom's following suit with Pam last week. He found some pretty place to read, uh, read outside. Well, let me, let me pray. Let's focus our heart, church. Be with me here. Be with me uh, as we hear uh, God's word. Let's pray together. Uh, and uh, Father God, uh, we thank you for, uh, for your goodness. Thank you uh, that you uh, transcend uh, space and time. <laughs> that uh, we uh, can be together in Jesus Christ, uh, e even though there is a physical uh, difference uh, right, uh, right now. And uh, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would work just as powerfully as you do uh, within this building, uh, within our homes this morning. Uh, your word that Jesus Christ, that the gospel in which we have placed our hope uh, would shine brightly this morning, shine brightly in our hearts, lift our eyes. Jesus, we pray, have your way with us. Uh, touch us, form us, shape us. Uh, we give you ourself. Um, we pray this in the name of our Savior. Amen. All right, Tom McCauley has our passage this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Sue's behind the camera. I'll be reading Acts 12, verses 20 to the end. The death of Herod. 
Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country was dependent on the king's country for food. And on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an ornation to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. All right. All right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for that technology there. So I'm calling this sermon Withering Grass, Fading Flowers, and the Enduring Word of God. Uh, if you're familiar with your Bible, if you're familiar in particular with the Old Testament, you know that this is an allusion to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. It says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Uh, this is a reminder for us. Uh, not to get lost uh, in the things uh, of this world, whether those are good things or those are uh, bad things. So let's do uh, just a, a, a real quick review here. So we're in Acts chapter 12, and last week, if you remember, uh, Peter was in prison. James, the apostle, was dead, and King Herod was triumphing. By the end of the chapter this morning, we see quite a reversal. Peter is free. Herod is dead, and the word of God is triumphing. In the space in between, we learn a powerful lesson, and it's this, that, that appearances can be deceiving. That which seems so solid, Herod's threat felt so real, but he's gone. He's gone. You know, that, that which we can see uh, with our physical eyes is not as important as what we see with our spiritual eyes. Which, by the way, is not to say that that which we see with eyes of faith is any less real. It's just that it's less obvious. The grass withers. The flowers fade. But the word of our God will stand forever. So that's the lesson. That's where we're going. That's what I want you to see uh, in this passage. Now, now enter in uh, here with me. Can we, can we take a moment and just enter into to our passage? I want you to consider for a moment this morning, what was it like uh, to be counted amongst the believers there uh, in the early church? What, what was it like to be a Christian living in Jerusalem uh, at this time? Can, can you imagine? I mean, you, even for a moment, can you imagine what their experience was like? Can you imagine the, the uncertainty that they dealt with? The, the, the anxiety? The, the, the fear? J James is dead, right? Beloved leader of the church, James, the apostle James, one of Jesus' closest friends is, is dead. Herod killed him. Peter in prison, broke free, but still a wanted man. The, the Jews hated the Christians. Herod had the power to kill them. I said last week that this is, this is not a David uh, versus Goliath story. Uh, David versus Goliath is one man versus another man or, or versus a boy. But this, this is David versus uh, the entire Philistine army. Right? Can you imagine what that was like to feel like the entire world is against you? And Luke is telling the story. Luke, the author of Acts, is telling the story of what's going on. And here's the thing. Buried uh, below the surface of that story, yet not really that far beneath the surface, I believe is a message of hope. It's a message of hope for the politically powerless uh, Christians living uh, there in the early church, for the weak and vulnerable little church, for those who were so anxious and, and scared. Um, this is a subtle message of hope that I actually believe Luke has been building over several uh, chapters now. He's been putting it together, but it lies below the surface. It's not immediately obvious. If you're not paying attention, uh, you're going to miss it. <laughs> you, you know, so, 
<laughs> Imagine um, later today you turn on your uh, television, you see, uh, see one, of, one of those politicians uh, being interviewed. And uh, what does almost every uh, politician wear? A little American flag uh, pin. And, and suppose you see that pin turned upside down. What would you think? I don't know. Somebody called wardrobe. Uh, that man needs uh, maybe some closer attention. And, and then you turn on uh, the television the next day and you see the flag is, uh, is upside down a second time. Uh, and you begin to wonder. Uh, the, the third time you see it, you say, I, I, I know something's going on here. There's something so, so small, but I'm sure there must be something going on here that has to be uh, intentional. That's what Luke is doing here. That's what Luke is doing. He, he's telling a story uh, underneath the main story. He, he's, he's giving us a message. And this is what it is. There was only one Lord. There's only one Lord. And his name is not Herod. And his name is not Caesar. His name uh, is Jesus. P Peter's already given us the punchline uh, to that story. Remember Peter, Acts uh, chapter 10, he goes into the house of a Roman centurion. The centurions, right, were, were the ones who killed Jesus. He goes right into the man's house. Do you remember this? And he says, Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of all. There is one Lord, and his name uh, is Jesus. And so that's the story. That's the story that's going on uh, beneath the story. That's the story that Luke wants us to see. That's the story that I want you to see this, this morning. Uh, and so we're going to hold that in the back of our mind uh, as we uh, dig into our passage uh, this morning. And um, here's where we're going. Three-point uh, sermon. Here's the roadmap. We're going to look at number one, uh, the predicament of the people. That's the predicament of the people of Tyre and Sidon. And we're going to look at the pride of Herod. Uh, and then finally, the power of God. And uh, as we engage this passage, though, we're looking for that story beneath the story that there is only one true king, there's only one Lord, and his name uh, is Jesus. So let's dig uh, now into the passage. We begin with the predicament of the people. So Luke is going to shift his attention now uh, from what was going on in Jerusalem uh, to uh, the Gentile cities of Tyre and Sidon. Uh, Tyre and Sidon, uh, powerful cities. Uh, we see them throughout uh, the Bible. Uh, Gentile cities uh, here in the New Testament era. They're, they're located in the region of Phoenicia. And they have a predicament. People in Tyre and Sidon find themselves in a, in a difficult spot. Uh, a dispute apparently has arisen between them and Herod, and we're not told the substance of what that, uh, what that was about, uh, but verse 20, Luke tells us uh, that Herod was angry with them. And what little we know about Herod, that's not good news for the people of Tyre and Sidon to have Herod uh, angry uh, with them. The problem is exasperated uh, when uh, Herod decides to stop doing business uh, with them as, as far as selling food. Um, uh, th this was his, his bargaining chip, I, I, I suppose. So he stopped selling the people of Tyre and Sidon uh, food. Can you imagine uh, how disastrous this would have been for the people living in those cities in the ancient world? <laughs> What happened here when there was a rumor the toilet paper was going to run out? Uh, <laughs> what, what, what is that like when your food supply is cut off? Right? Can, can you imagine uh, what uh, that was like? Uh, you're sitting in your living room there and tired and silent. What's coming across every TV screen? Right? What's going on with this food supply? Will we be able to eat tomorrow? How long is it going to last? I can guarantee you that this was the hot-button uh, political issue uh, of the day. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? You think the people of Tyre and Sidon had some strong opinions as to, as to what should be done? All right, let's go to war. Let's just look elsewhere. The leaders of Tyre and Sidon chose uh, a diplomatic route. Look there in the passage, they pro chose diplomacy. It says they go to Herod with one accord, not in one accord. <laughs> I'm getting booze here in, the, uh, <laughs> in our church. You're not booing me at home. They came with one accord. They came with one accord, united. Now they've got a connection with a man named Blastus. He's the king's chamberlain. 
There's a good baby name for you, uh, by the way. Blastus. I had to look this up. It's Greek. It means bud or sprout. His name is Blastus. And um, this seems like a reasonable approach, doesn't it? Let's pursue a diplomatic approach to bargain uh, with Herod and, and see what, this, uh, what, what, uh, what comes about for us. Uh, but it stands in stark contrast with the episode that began this chapter. Right? Remember where this chapter began. James was dead. Peter in prison. P Peter's in kind of a, a similar position as Tyre and Sidon, isn't he? Right? Completely at the mercy of Herod. Um, and what's the church do? Well, they don't pursue a diplomatic route. They don't stage protest. They don't flood Facebook. And please hear me. I'm not saying those things are wrong. Please hear me. I'm not saying those things are wrong. But what's the church do? It's not what the people of Tyre and Sidon do. Right. Verse 5, if you have your Bible, you can look, look with me. Verse 5, we looked at this last week. The church prays. The church prays. They're in a very similar situation as Tyre and Sidon, but the church prays. So similar predicaments. Similar predicaments, but two very different responses. Let's see how this goes. So that's the predicament. That's the predicament of the people. Now let's look at the, the pride. Look at the pride of, of Herod, and there's a lot here uh, for, the, for the pride of Herod. Verse 21 says, On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes and took a seat upon the throne and delivered an oration. Kids, that means a, a speech. He delivered a speech uh, to them. Uh, the Jewish historian Josephus, some of you have uh, heard that name before, Josephus, a secular writer, not a Christian, a Jewish background. He's born about the time that uh, Saul has his uh, conversion experience on the road of uh, Damascus, prolific writer. Uh, one of the things that he wrote is the Antiquities uh, of the Jews. And uh, he actually includes details of this story uh, in his writing. I've got the link uh, for you on, uh, on my blog if you're interested um, in that. And I need to tell you, of course, we hold the writings of Josephus loosely, uh, not because we have any reason to doubt them, but that the, they're not the inspired uh, Word of God. And so it sheds maybe some interesting uh, light on it, but it's, that's all it is. It's just a work of man. Uh, but what uh, Josephus has to say is interesting. For instance, uh, Josephus tells us that these royal robes that Herod put on uh, were made completely of silver completely of, of silver. Uh, he says that Herod came into the theater, uh, apparently that's where this, this oration was held, in the early morning hours. And so can you picture the scene? In the early morning, the sun's uh, low angle uh, of, of those rays uh, hitting uh, the razzle-dazzle silver uh, robe that, uh, that Herod's uh, wearing, and he's, he's shining. If you're having a, a hard time picturing what this is like, let me help you. <laughs> I want you to picture Donald Trump uh, or so that I'm not accused of partisanship, uh, Joe Biden. <laughs> Picture either one of those men wrapped in aluminum foil and uh, standing uh, on the porch of the White House delivering a speech. <laughs> right? That's what this is like. If Josephus is to be believed, uh, that's what this is like. Uh, there's, there's Herod dressed in his royal robe, sitting upon his royal throne, uh, opening his royal mouth. And the people were shouting, verse 22, the voice of a God and not of a man. Josephus tells us there was a voice heard here uh, and then a voice uh, heard there. And then the chorus joined in adoring and, and worshiping the mighty King Herod. I think either one of two things are going on here. Uh, number one, possibly the people are deceived. It's possible that they are truly deceived. They saw a remarkable sight. Maybe they did really think that he was uh, a god. Uh, but I think more likely than not, uh, this is just an attempt at flattery, right? They're just trying to flatter him. They're trying to, they're, they're giving Herod uh, what, what Herod wants. They're telling him uh, what he wants to hear. This is a real danger, isn't it? Uh, this is a real danger for anyone in a, in a leadership position, isn't it? Right? To, to, to gather people uh, around you to just uh, tell you what you want to hear. It, it's amazing how quickly leaders can get out of touch with reality for uh, this very reason. Uh, because they, because we surround ourselves uh, uh, with, uh, with people who just tell us uh, what we want to hear, who, who, who flatter us. Uh, but this is more than just a leadership issue. This is more than a leadership issue. Um, 
Have you ever heard the phrase, uh, an echo chamber before? Have you ever heard that phrase, an, an echo chamber? I've got a picture. And, uh, somehow this is going to magically appear here, here, maybe in front of me, over here. <laughs> this, is a, uh, this is an echo chamber. Uh, actually, actually, it's a tunnel at uh, Fair Hill. Uh, I think my family has gone through this, uh, through this tunnel, but the, the Geralds, Ralph, and Danica members here, they're, they're in Fair Hill all the time. I said, next time you see an echo chamber, take a picture. I'll use it as a, as a sermon illustration. So here, here you go. That's an echo chamber. You know how an echo chamber works, right? Uh, you, you stand in that tunnel and you say, hello, and you hear back. You can say it at home. Hello, you're amazing. You're amazing. Hey, everyone's playing along here. I don't know if you're playing along at home. You're great. You're great. That's an echo chamber, right? You're just hearing your own voice, though. You're just hearing your own voice. Herod is in an echo chamber. He's dressed like a god. He spoke like a god. I don't know if the picture is still there, but uh, you, can, you can make that go away. Uh, he, he dressed like a god. He spoke like a god. Uh, and people said, you're a god. And he said, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> yeah, I knew it. <laughs> I'll tell you, th- this is a bit of a side. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we need to be careful, don't we? Uh, in, in these tumultuous times that we find ourselves in, that we are not in uh, an echo uh, chamber. You know, you know, for instance, as, as we're trying to process what's going on in the world uh, around us, we need to make sure that we're not in an echo chamber. Um, if, if you're uh, consuming your news, for instance, primarily through social media, you, you, need, to be, uh, you need to be careful that you're not uh, in an echo chamber, that, that you're not just being fed uh, the, the very things that uh, social media would, would, like you to, would like you to read. Um, we need to be careful that we're not surrounding ourselves, church, with people who are just like us. We, we don't want to be caught in that, in that echo chamber. I need to be careful that I'm not caught caught in, in an echo chamber. Herod was caught in an echo chamber. People are shouting the voice of a God, but not of a man. This is not the first time. This is not the first time uh, that uh, this has happened in the book of Acts. Uh, remember, Peter goes into uh, Cornelius' house. Cornelius, the, the Roman centurion, man of great power, and he sees Peter, the fisherman, and he falls down at his feet and begins to worship and, and Peter doesn't uh, say, oh, 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 well, you know, oh, you know he, he doesn't stand for it for a moment. N- n- not a second. Get up. Get on your feet. I'm not a god. I'm just a man. Peter knew his place. Herod, it would seem, did not know his place. Okay. So we've looked at the predicament of the people. We've looked, uh, just beginning to scratch the surface, actually, of the pride of Herod. But now let's see the, let's see the power of God. Let's see the power of God in this passage. And picture the scene here again. Remember, Herod's out there. If Josephus is to be believed in a grand theater in the early morning hours, dressed in his royal robes, the rousal, the dazzle going everywhere. He's seated upon his throne. He's delivering this royal speech. (laughs) And things change in the blink of an eye. They change in the blink of an eye. Josephus is going to tell us he looks up and sees an owl and took that as a bad omen. I don't know if that happened or not. Luke tells us the the true story, and an angel of the Lord came and struck him down. That forms an interesting um, wordplay, actually. You remember earlier in the chapter, Peter, uh, in prison, uh, it's the middle of the night, and who shows up? An angel shows up. The light, uh, blinding light, comes with the angel. Peter's still sleeping. So, so, so at peace is he with the will of God that he's sleeping. And so the angel, uh, Luke tells us, you remember that? Uh, I think it's verse 7. I'll look at my notes here. Verse 7. <laughs> struck him. Struck him. And the angel of the Lord comes back here, verse 23, and strikes someone else. And it has quite uh, a, a different effect. Um, Josephus is going to tell us he felt a sudden pain come on him, and he dies five days later. Again, I don't know if that's, that's true. I don't know if that's completely contrary to the biblical account. Now, Luke tells us immediately an angel of the Lord came and struck him down because he didn't give glory to God. He's eaten by worms, and he breathed his last. And don't miss this. Why, why was Herod struck down? Because he didn't give glory to God. He didn't give glory to God. He became a, a glory thief. <laughs> oh, people of Tyre and Sidon, you who look to Herod for help, what will you do now? What will you do now? 
The psalmist has said it so well. Look at this, Psalm 146, verse 3. It says, put not your trust in princes and a son of man in whom there is no salvation. Tyre and Sidon, if you're looking to King Herod for salvation, you're looking in the wrong place. People of Cornerstone, if you're looking to some politician for salvation, you are looking in the wrong place. Put not your trust there. Psalm 146, verse 4 says, When his breath departs, he returns to the earth, and on that very day his plans perish. Goodbye, Herod. Goodbye, Herod. But, <laughs> but the word of God increased and multiplied. The word of God increased and multiplied. And remember where this began. Peter is in prison. James is dead. And Herod is triumphing. And by the end, Peter is free. Herod is dead. And the word of God is triumphing. There's the message of hope, church. There, there's the message of hope that Luke has for his readers. There's the message of hope, O oh, little church of Jerusalem. Don't fret about Herod. There's another king. There's a better king. And his name is Jesus. He is Lord of all. He is our king who will never die. His plans will never fail. His purposes will never be overthrown. His kingdom will never end. His love for us will never grow cold. His affection for us will never be diminished. He is a wellspring of life a refuge, a fortress, the God in whom we trust. And his name is Jesus. He, he is Lord of all. Wow. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of God will stand forever. This is a good reminder for us. What a wonderful reminder for us wherever we find ourselves today. Perhaps you find yourself this morning and this moment in some bit of, bit of suffering. The Word of God will endure forever. Perhaps you, you find yourself flourishing in the midst uh, of what's going on. We're, we're reminded even then, right, the Word of God will endure forever. We're reminded of the shortness of life, that this world really and truly is not our home, that there is something that is eternal, that you and I have an immortal soul, that we will spend eternity either in the gracious presence of Jesus Christ our Savior or forever cast away. This is a reminder for us to live for that which is eternal, to live for that which will last, to order rightly our days. I want to read to you a line from uh, J.C. Ryle. I read this just last night. J.C. Ryle, an evangelical pastor, uh, 19th century England, contemporary of Charles Spurgeon. Listen to what he says on this topic. He says, I don't stop to prove that men have souls, immortal, eternal souls, but I do ask that all men live as if they believed it. Lived as if you really believed that we were not sent into the world merely to spin cotton and grow corn and hoard up gold, but to glorify God and enjoy him forever. He says, read your Bible. Become acquainted with its contents. Seek the Lord in prayer and pour out your heart before him. Go to a place of worship regularly and hear the gospel preached. Keep the Sabbath holy and give God his day. And if any ask you the reason why, if wife or ch child or companion say, what are you about? <laughs> Answer them boldly like a man and say, I do these things because I have a soul. Because I am living for that which is eternal. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Church, that is our eternal hope. We put 
we put not our hope in the blessings of this world. In the midst of good times, we are reminded the best is yet to come. And so we don't let our hearts rest in the pleasures of this life. We don't let those things blind us to that inheritance that is kept in heaven for us. In the midst of difficult times, in the midst of our difficult times, we are reminded the better days lie ahead. That Jesus, our Savior, has secured for us an eternal home. And he stands ready to reveal that at the last time. Church, would you lift your eyes? Would you lift your eyes this morning to that place? Would you see the Savior who lived, who died, who rose again for you? Put your hope there. Amen. Amen. Praise team, and I invite you to, to come up at this time as I read just the last verse that sets us up for all that's coming. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. Remember, they had an offering that they uh, delivered. And when they completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. We're going to meet all three of these men uh, later in the book of Acts. Luke is just uh, uh, reminding us uh, that there's more to this story. Let's pray. And we're going to worship. We're going to close our worship service here uh, t- together in song. Now let's pray. Father, we, uh, we thank you. We thank you that, uh, that we do have a home in glory <laughs> that outshines the sun. Uh, we, we have a hope that is deeper and brighter than the things of this world. Uh, that that you, uh, you have given us a refuge. You have given us a fortress that outshines even the deepest pit of despair that we can fall into in these present times. And Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you would send forth your Holy Spirit even in this moment. E- even now, we pray, to, 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 to remind us of that which is eternal. To put our hope in you, Jesus. Would you do that? Would, would you begin a movement of renewal uh, in this faith community and in other uh, communities of of faith who call on you as Lord and Savior to to remind us to live uh, for that which is eternal. The grass withers, the flower fades, but you, Jesus Christ, your word stands forever. It's in your name we pray. Amen.